Welcome to the Air Combat Simulation Podcast, brought to you by BVR Productions. Together with content creators, mission builders, experts, and enthusiasts, we explore the comprehensive world of combat aircraft simulation. The second episode of the Air Combat Sim. Uh, today we're together with Jabba, Red Kite, Scooby, and Trigger, and our uh, special guest for this episode, uh, Jack O. But before we get to the interview, um, what's up with you guys? What, are you, what have you been doing lately, uh, Jabba? Uh, not a whole lot. I have received a whole bunch of hardware that I'm going to have to review um, in the coming months here. Uh, so I will be basically key binding for the next month and a half over and over and over <laughs> again. Um, but it'll be worth it. And uh, I got the F-14 stick from both Verpal and BKB. I have uh, some rudder pedals, ACE-2 pedals, I believe they're called, from Verpal. I have the CM-2 base and stick also from Verpal. And, uh, and then I have a couple other things that I want to review that I've bought myself. Um, and then maybe another video comparing them all. But uh, big wishes starting 2020 hardware strong. So oh, that sounds cool. Uh, Red Kite, any new tutorials? Um, sadly, I've not been able to work, to be honest. I've been caught up in uh, real life struggles instead. So I'm a bit light on the channel. I apologize for that, but not much I can do for the moment, I'm afraid. I hope to get some cool stuff out in the near, well, near future, but we'll have to see on that one. I have mm. been uh, designing a button box. I bought a uh, a, v a Verpal um, VPC mount, the desk mount, and I intend on building a button box into the cavity on the front where you uh, you have the uh, screw fittings to change the height. So I think that'd be quite cool when I finally uh, finish designing it. That's, that's cool. I have a problem with that because I'm flying with VR mostly, and uh, it's like always a struggle between VR and building a nice pit. And I think building a pit with VR doesn't make too much sense as I've been designing mine with VR in mind, so I've been trying to pick out switches that have very different feels or caps to them, so I can tell what they are to touch, or add uh, metal bars or something around the edges of the switch to tell me where my hand is on the board. That's nice. I'd, I'd, I'd like to try something like that out. I, I screwed some stuff on my keyboard, <laughs> it kind of works, but it's not as uh, sophisticated. Uh, how about you, Trigger? Hey, Trigger here from the Alert 5 Podcast. Doing good. Just got in at midnight last night from a uh, three-day trip. So now I'm home and uh, off for a few days and Dut in sport, they are flying today, so they won't be able to make it, but uh, glad to be here. Cool. And Scooby? Yeah, well, I've been uh, working primarily with uh, my gear. Thanks to Jabbers, I now am a proud owner of a real simulator uh, stick and the F-16 stick with it as well. So uh, it's absolutely fantastic. But uh, I'm still working and trying to find the right balance between that. I think as you guys were saying, the sim pit and uh, and uh, sort of just the mounts. So it's been, it's a. I think uh, when Jabbers told me the other day, it never ends. I thought that was a, a pretty wise and real and uh, pretty telling. So it, it never ends. It, isn't F16 stick the same as the A10 stick? Oh, I'm wrong here. It's similar. Um, in the F-16, from what I have heard and understood, is the CMS does not depress, but everything else is mostly the same. Uh, but the difference in the gear that uh, Rob bought is the, uh, it's the force sensing stick, so it also doesn't really move, uh, unlike the A-10. You know, it moves around like a normal, most every plane does, but the F-16 stick is all force sensing. So the base that he bought and the stick that he bought go together, and it's actually based on the amount of pressure you're pushing, not... Uh, a gimbal. So like in the real thing, right? That was what uh, Jello mentioned last time. Yep, yep. Nice. All right. Um, so if there's anything else, um, or maybe I'll add something from my side. Uh, just one thing about... Uh, so we've been talking to, speaking to Jello and Kevin Miller, author of Raven 1, about the campaign we're working on. And we decided to bundle it with the super carrier, so to be able to use all the goodies that will come up with the super carrier, including the deck crew and uh, and ATC and all the other stuff, because we believe that even though it is a separate module, you have to have 
it will just add so much more to immersion and and the way the campaign is going to play uh, so i hope everyone will be okay with that uh, but yeah it took us we had a long discussion about it but we decided that we want to bring you the best we have or possibly we can have in in dcs and that's the only way to do it i guess when you say bundle it you mean we're going to include the supercarrier in the missions not so much bundle it as a purchase or 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 both I mean that, that it means that you will need to have the super carrier to play the campaign, right. uh, at least in the beginning. Gotcha. I don't know if it's possible maybe later to do another version, but just coming after Raven One experience and, and landing on an empty tennis will just not not feel right. I think it's the right. I think it's absolutely the right move. I think that um, you know I've been on the sidelines watching the exchange go back and forth between uh, Kevin Jello and and Baltic, and it's the amount of detail going into it's pretty fantastic. So I think the more that we can create uh, something that's really going to be true to the story, um, as well as you know taking advantage of the new features, I think it's going to be fantastic. The good thing is that even on Hoggit, I think ninety-five percent of responses were positive. So I think it's going to be fine. All right, so let's move to the main part of the podcast. So uh, welcome, uh, Chuck Ol. You are the legend of the DCS, and I think you're the person that made the DCS much more accessible to lots of people out there. So it's good to have you here. Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, term legend is a big, uh, it's a bit too big for me, but uh, <laughs> thanks for the compliment. No, I mean, but when you when you read the any forums, you would find that the first place almost anyone would go to is not the manual. Maybe some people go to YouTube, but most of them will go to will ask, "Oh, is the chat guide for this chat guide for this uh, uh, module?" So I think it's it's a, it's it's a deserved term, I guess. Well, thanks a lot. So, um, could you tell us a little bit, us a little bit about yourself? Uh, so, how long have you been playing Sims? What do you do for a living, etc.? Where are you from? Okay, well, my name is Charles. I'm from Quebec, Canada. Uh, I've been flight simming since well, probably uh, 2011, 2012. I think I first started with the DCS P51. Uh, I've always been a big Warburg fan. And um, I flew online for a couple of years in other sims like Cliffs of Dover, Flying Spitfires and Hurricanes. And uh, eventually, a few years down the line, I started writing some pretty rudimentary guides for uh, rather simplistic sims and eventually uh, as years went by i started doing some more complex pdfs that culminated in uh, the chucks guides that we have today so basically at the beginning it was just a set of small notes that could fit pretty much on a small napkin eventually uh, it, the notes ended up adding and adding and Little by little, I ended up doing some more complex documents. You remember the first one? Was it the P51? Actually, no. The The first one might have been, if I remember correctly, I think it was for Cliffs of Dover from the IL-2 series. Oh, yeah, I, I remember. Back then, we used to do these big uh, bomber nights. So we'd have big wings of 12 to 20 bombers. It was just a magnificent magnificent sight we'd go in big waves trying to bomb airfields like kelly mark and um, one of the big issues we had is that uh, we were flying the only bomber available for the british at the time which was the bristol blenheim which is uh, it's not a very good one you know it's just it carries four bombs it's got practically a ceiling of around twenty thousand feet and at some point we just realized that the biggest issue we had is that most people didn't know how to operate the thing. I mean, people had a general idea of uh, engine settings, but there weren't any written materials or procedures that we could use. So at some point I just decided, well, I may as well just write a some rudimentary bombing guide for the Bristol Blenheim. And eventually people started, well, why don't you do stuff for the for the German bombers and then for the fighters as well? And eventually I ended up with 600 pages of, uh, of different procedures for every plane in Cliffs of Dover. So I guess it just snowballed from there. And I mean, I always had this fascination with, with uh, World War II 
aircraft. I mean, with their engines being super temperamental, very delicate, fragile creatures. It's always uh, I've always liked trying to figure out how they work, how they, uh, how to operate them properly, because it's always uh, somewhat poorly documented in most of the simulators we had. It is quite incredible looking at the number of the guys you have out there. Do you know, like by heart, how many you have now published? I think uh, last time I counted, there were around six thousand pages, probably more. And I think there were fifty-nine guides. Yeah, fifty-nine. Wow. It's the kind of thing that you look back and you just wonder, like, I'm never doing this again. And then you realize, well, sh shit, I'm still working on another one. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Chuck, Jabbers. Um, when you started getting into the P-51, did you have any background knowledge in aviation at all? Or was that kind of your first intro to it all? Well, I've, I, I'd say with the P-51, I didn't necessarily start with it. I mean, I started with the, uh, the Spitfires and Hurricanes. In cliffs of Dover, and you get to a point where you have a certain level of comfort, and then you come to another sim, and you expect that all these things you've learned will translate directly. And boy, uh, I was in for a surprise. It, uh, this has brought me down to earth. I mean, literally in balls of flames. The P-51 was a really the first aircraft where I was legitimately scared to fly in a dogfight. Because it's got such temperamental aerodynamic characteristics, you know. Yeah, I think we've all been in a turn fight and experienced that snap roll. Oh yeah, it's a nasty one. But that brings me to the question. I mean, so if you've done fifty nine guides, and you've so it means you you've really learned by heart all of those modules. How how do you go about it? Do you do you really learn everything and go through every process and everything you should do or could do in a cockpit, or you have some other methodology for that? Uh, well, the the way I usually go about things is I stir. I first start doing research. So I try to find as much public documentation I can get my hands on. So flight manuals, charts, even YouTube videos. There's a couple of there's a couple of great ones for civilian sims. There are also a bunch of uh, CBTs, computer based trainings, which are a series of videos that teach pretty much about the different systems of an aircraft. And uh, the research phase can go for a long time. It could go for from days to almost weeks. So it takes a long time. So uh, I, before I even start writing, I just want to make sure I'm comfortable with the plane first so I know what I'm talking about, which is sometimes uh, some content creators, they tend to try to make it up as they go along, which isn't a bad thing if you're short on time. But uh, eventually, when you end up explaining something, and you're like, "Well, is it really this? I I can't remember. I'm just gonna go back." And sometimes it just gives a a mess of a result. But yeah, yeah. Most of the time, I just do a bunch of research, and once I'm once I'm comfortable, I start writing up the cockpit description section so I know where everything is and uh, what uh, what's the terminology used for every switch, display, uh, subsystem, and then I just go from there. Yeah, I, I can tell firsthand that, you know, after experiencing uh, watching you break down the JF-17, I was, I personally was fascinated because um, I always have that problem is where do you start? I mean, obviously you can start with cockpit overview and startup and taxi takeoff, but then, but then what you like, uh, you know, especially some of the planes like JF-17, F-16, F-18, they, they just systems just get so complex. So uh, watching you work on the JF-17 was, was really fascinating to me and to see your progress and how fast you moved through everything and the questions you asked. I, You were like, oh, what's this and what's that and what's this? And I'm looking over the documentation that, that was given to us by DECA Ironworks and I'm like, I don't even see that. Where are you getting this information from? So I thought I thought it was fascinating to, to, to watch you work and uh, I, I appreciated that a lot. Well, thanks. Uh, well, I've already got some some background in aviation. Uh, in my day job, I work in uh, flight simulators. So we develop flight simulators, uh, some of them level Ds. So they're pretty pretty much uh, up there when you're trying to um, when uh, you're trying to train new pilots. And the way the information is usually divided in an aircraft is by ETAs. So they're divided by uh, system functions. So you've got uh, say ETA 24 for 
uh, electrical systems, you've got power plant systems, you've got uh, pneumatic systems, you've got ECS systems, that sort of stuff. So in my head, the way I learn things is more like an engineer. So I tend to divide an aircraft as a bunch of functions and systems together. And then I see how these systems interact with each other. This is why most of the time my questions seem really, uh, <laughs> really niche. So this is like, well, why is he asking about this? Well, I'm thinking about, oh, well, this thing talks to this other thing and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's, that, that's exactly what I was getting at. You were breaking down systems and asking about this and that. And I was like, where, where, where's that coming from? Yeah, but you know, the, the, the side effect of this is the way I present things is not the way the things are presented for to pilots during training. Most of the time, well, the, what I'm aware of is that pilots are trained with flows. So they get, uh, if they want to do a startup procedure, they're going to go about in a very specific way in order to uh, for them to have a visual mindset of uh, I'm checking this switch, then this switch, then this switch, and they have some kind of a pattern in their head. Whereas my method is more, um, I'd say it's, it's, it's a different mindset. It's a different way to do, see things, which is, is less instinctive for some people, but uh, but but it works for others. But speaking about you gathering information and preparing uh, to, to guides, um, are you in touch with the third party devs or with Ableton Dynamics people so, so you get some information directly from them? Uh, I'd say with Eagle Dynamics, not so much. Uh, for I've got other some great relationships with uh, other third party developers uh, like uh, the Rasban folks, uh, for instance. Um, also, that's uh, AVO Dev helped me a lot. I had a lot of questions for their uh, AVO jet, and they were really helpful in the process. I don't deal that much with uh, other with some third parties like Magnitude, but most of the time I have some. Uh, I, I dealt a lot with the Deca as well, since uh, Jabbers uh, may remember. Yes, lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> I ask this question at two in the morning. Is like, why is no one answering? It's like, Chuck, they're sleeping. Yeah, yeah, oh. and, and uh, typically my Discord is muted, but for important things like when uh, you know we we spun up that channel to talk to Deca, and it was me, you, uh, Red Kite, you were in that one too, I believe, and um, I would leave that on to give me notifications when people are talking, so that I would get uh, you know we only had like a week and a half, so I wanted to get as much information as fast as possible. So I just wanted to know, and uh, I would wake up in the morning and I would have you know thirty, forty notifications that somebody was talking and it was mostly Chuck asking questions. <laughs> You're probably like, where's the mute button for this guy? Oh, <laughs> well, they're, the great thing is they're fascinating questions. Like they're things that I wouldn't have thought about. So I, I appreciated them uh, and it helped me learn, you know, uh, what to look at and where to go. So I, I didn't mind them um, and they didn't wake me up. So I think it was fine. So I really want to uh, commend Decker and the team. They really work quite hard for us when we were doing the preview stuff as they were. <laughs> person they were they were up all night and all day working hard toward the release and still found time to answer mine and chuck's and jabber's questions as we uh relentlessly hammered them with detailed questions or like how does the targeting pod do this how does x y and z work it was the guys are phenomenal i don't know how they managed to get through and not pass out yeah totally agree and i, I think i find that true for most uh the third party devs that i've worked with um they, they all are very excited to to unveil the the jet or the plane that they're working on. So most of them, uh, you know, given the time, uh, will answer all of your questions. But I, I do feel like you said they, Deca didn't sleep because they were there was somebody constantly talking to us at, at all hours of the day. Yeah, you could tell they absolutely loved it and really wanted to show the best of the aircraft to us. And what was the development timeline for the GF-17? They said... Uh, I'm trying to think of the interview I did. I think they said it took them three years, but the last year, the first two years was kind of on off, but the last year was just constant. Yeah, I think they went on crunch mode for a year or something, which is insane if you ask me. Yeah. Yeah, I think they do it as a part-time sort of gig. They, they have their own full-time jobs, and then they come home and they crunch on the on their module for DCS. It's madness. Got to commend their work ethic and spirit to do it. It's it would it's it's so much hard work to create a module for DCS and so much research. Oh yeah, 
I'm sure Jabbers, you you remember uh, uh, back in the Hitler days <laughs> for the F-14 release. You were probably burning the midnight oil for weeks and weeks. Was, who were you directing that at? At you, Jab. Oh, sorry. I think you broke up a little bit there, at least for me. Uh, yeah, I wanted to make as much content for that as possible since I had it multiple months in advance. I didn't want to just sit on it. And uh, uh, I had actually told my wife, um, you're not going to see me for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> my and, people uh, need me. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't know if I could ever do that again, though. It was too much. I, I think I just got to take it as it, I go and at my pace. Um, it was it was a nice experiment, but I think even even as much as as much fun as it is to make that stuff, it is toll. It is a toll. It is taxing. But, but was she happy that you were gone for a while? No. Um, <laughs> well, maybe. Yeah, you're probably right. I think all of us here has come at some point to the moment where you just play some other game or some other thing and just leave this years behind and you feel like you're on holidays. I yeah. turn to, oh, to, yeah. to Beat Saber for that one. <laughs> something physical and some, you know, something fun, get some music and de-stress. Yeah, I'm surprised Chuck hasn't done it um, more often. <laughs> sometimes I wish I could. But you know, sometimes you, you get to DCS you get a bunch of headaches trying to figure out some stuff and you get back to say a triple a game that you pay say 80 bucks for and you realize well there's not that much to do in there i mean the whole sandbox thing with dcs is like an almost infinite replay replayability yeah and i think that um a lot of us i mean myself included lose sight in that you know, there is so much to learn and do in a single aircraft. And, you know, the price that's charged for it, while it always seems to go up, the amount of effort having to be put into this stuff. I mean, like, look at DECA. They, I don't, I forget what the price was for theirs, but they spent three years on it. And who knows how long it was before that to put research into it um, and make sure they wanted to do that module and get all the documentation and whatever. And, uh, you know, end of the day, you, most people, pay $50, $60 for a game uh, that has 20 to 30 hours lifetime play, you know, in single player. And I, you definitely get more out of that in most modules in DCS, just learning it. Yeah, just learning it, it's, it's about 20, 30 hours or more. That's, that's true. So uh, speaking about time, so uh, you said research is a few weeks sometimes. So how long on average does it take you to, to create a complete module? Uh, sorry, complete guide? Well, the earliest guys probably took uh say 40 hours 50 hours the later ones probably took around a bunch of hundreds of hours for the more complex modules like the hornet and the harrier one for instance because that's also pretty complex now i mean getting pretty complex oh yeah the, the harrier was a <laughs> one big mystery because like the mirage it's the guide that i that i did twice actually so the first iteration was uh, the first implementation of systems by Resbam. And once they overhauled a bunch of them, then I had to rewrite so much stuff. And I mean, Baltic, you, you must know about it because you wrote the manuals for for the Mirage. Yeah, that's true. I'm, I'm just about to finish the updated version probably next week. Well, you know, Baltic, I think you're in uh, some sort of unique position in that regard, especially uh, while well, you've created the real flight manual for the uh, for Razbam for the Mirage for instance and the and you're working on the Harrier as well and creating that sort of content is really really difficult because you tend to go in a level of detail that most content creators when they're, you know most tutorials are just sets of procedures that you follow but they don't go into a level of detail that is sufficient to understand how the whole aircraft works so uh, how all different systems interact with each other and i think this is where your job is one of the toughest ones because you need to know practically everything about the aircraft itself and i mean in my experience it adds a whole layer of complexity that most people aren't that familiar with in the first place I mean, I think it's much easier with the modules that have some doc like publicly uh accessible documents like natops and things like that so which is true for hornet or harrier but wasn't for instance for, for instance for mirage right yeah the uh, the french military 
is very secretive about what documentation they release to the public, especially when DASO, uh, DASO is uh, involved. Yeah, I experienced that as well. It was much more difficult to do anything with that. So, I mean, so if you've flo flown all the modules, uh, which do you think are your favorite ones right now? Which ones, I mean, the ones that you just fly for fun, but you not create anything? Hmm, that's a great question. Actually, I'd say my uh, probably my favorite module to fly just by itself, just for fun, would probably be the... Uh, the Spitfire and the Mustang. I've always been a fan of World War II birds, and to me, they're just so temperamental in the way you fly them that it's, it makes the whole experience really, really fun. Helicopter-wise, I'd say my favorite helicopter is probably um, either the Huey or the Mi-8. I mean, they're both very, very interesting machines. And strangely enough, the uh, the more the aircraft tries to kill me, the more I enjoy the experience. So it's a, it's a little strange, but you know. That's why I love the MiG twenty one. Oh yeah, that's another good one. Well, I'd say another one that is really unique is probably the Vigan by Heedler. This is such a unique aircraft in all sorts of shapes. It's one aircraft that I just start flying an hour and then I wake up well I don't not wake up but uh, at some point I just realized it's been three hours and I need to go to sleep really bad because it's two in the morning that's that's the one aircraft I have the least experience with I think and not for lack of wanting to learn it but um it's so foreign it's like it's the strangest aircraft in DCS in my opinion the uh, the computer on that and, my, and me do not get along. I absolutely cannot ab ab abhor that computer. <laughs> it's pushing in the keys and changing the <laughs> modes. I can't get my head around it. Yeah, I just can't work it. It doesn't gel with me. <laughs> Much as I love the aircraft, it's just that damn computer. It's always this thing about entering codes. It's like 9099. What, what does it mean? Yeah, I feel like I need a flip book with different emergency codes and uh, settings to uh, to handle. Ooh, whilst I'm flying at treetop level, it's, uh, it's quite a big ask <laughs> as a yeah. beginner. So does that mean uh, if I make a bunch of content about it, I won't be competing with you, Red Kite? <laughs> I've got too many things to do right now anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I kid. Uh, but there's always this kind of race for exclusivity when it comes to content creators. That's probably really, really tiring. Yeah, yeah. I, I love pre-release for this reason, because often we get a, you know, a period of grace where people agree not to do anything for a while so people can make a nice, good video and nobody's competing for time. We all just say... We release this date, and everyone has their pre-prepared video. Everyone's had good time to prepare it, and nobody has to rush. But once it's out in public, it's a, it's a free for all. And I, I find that really annoying. Like, uh, I, 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 you, you get that feeling. Oh, I got to get this content out, um, and not so much for the views, but you know, people are going to want it um, once they get their hands on the module. Like, oh, how do I do this? Well, you know, there's no videos from you know, so-and-so who happens to be one of the five that I go to, you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't, I don't care so much for the views and, and being first. I, I definitely don't care about being first, but, um, making that content available for the people who want it and are going to look for it from you. Uh, that's, that's where it gets really frustrating and, and getting it pre-released to be able to do that stuff. Like I did with that 14, um, and not so much, unfortunately the, the JF 17, but, um, thankfully you were there red kite to do that. I think that, that's where it comes into play for me, being able to get access early. Um, but everybody's different, and um, but that's how I feel. Yeah, you want to get the content out while it's still relevant to people that are learning, so you can help people. But it's, uh, you don't have enough time to do it all. So what I tend to do is I pick difficult subjects like the targeting pod, and I will go in depth and make sure people can use them, because it's a big feature people want to use. And I don't have the time to, say, make five, six videos on very simpler topics. So I just go for the harder stuff straight away. Yeah, would, would you say that that's uh, more fun also, though? I mean, I, I love ground attacks, so I'll always go straight for the targeting pod or any complex ground system. But um, I feel like you can learn a lot of things on your own. Often simpler things, like, say, the startup, you can get from a list of instructions and a detailed like, picture of the, the cockpit that's been labeled. But when it comes to interactive systems, it's more difficult to explain them on a paper-based or PDF or manual. 
than it is to show in a video format, which is what I try to to do with my videos. So I think it's this is kind of awkward situation where people want thing, you know, they want everything right away. You can't present it. You pick what you can. You find the battles you can. Well, as yeah. a relatively new guy, I would say that you know I I look for all you guys uh, to learn, and it's actually very complimentary to get the PDF uh, from Chuck. And you know, it, getting started, I think that would be my biggest criticism um, is that there just seems to be so much distributed uh, great content out there, but it's you kind of have to meander through to find the good great nuggets of it and like you know chuck i mean you were probably one of the, the first person who introduced me to dcs um and you know and that was sort of the anchor that got me going and then certainly uh jabbers and red kite and baltic you know all of the, the great content that is you know that's out there is is great but like i said i find i don't think it's either or because sometimes what i'll find is that one one video on YouTube might actually have a different take on it, which is what I need to hear to get me over the over the line. But I think you can. I'm actually thinking about merging the, the, the world, worlds. So uh, I'm writing slowly the manual for the Harrier, and what I'm doing whenever I finish a part and I find a good video, uh, I'll be in touch with you guys because I want to put a link to that because most of the people will read PDF now on on some mobile device or iPad or whatever. So it's pretty easy to just click on it. You read it in the manual, you click on it, you can watch it, um, how it's done. So I think I'll be in touch, uh, asking you if I could link some of your videos uh, in the manual directly. Yeah, that's a good idea. I think that's kind of how the approach went with uh, the F-14 is, um, you know, I was I got media access, started making the, the flight characteristics video and I made the first look and, um, and then, you know, I was talking about some of the things that I would like to cover for tutorials. And as I was talking about it with Heat Blur, we both kind of were like, you know, uh, and sorry, not both. They were kind of like, hey, you know, if you make good tutorials and they go in depth and about the stuff that are relevant to a chapter, we'll stick it at the end of the chapter. And I was like, oh, OK, well, that makes perfect sense. So then I started going about it from that approach. Um, you know, what is what does the manual talk about here? Okay, how can I make a video about this? And um, that's kind of the same same direction uh, we went there. So that'll be good. I think if if that becomes a standard, I think that's very helpful for everybody because you get done reading about it and then you can go look at it and how it's used, uh, you know, in put, put into practice. But that also brings you to uh, back to Chuck and the question because um, you have to hear two of the most uh, well known YouTubers that, that produce tutorials. So how much? Uh, do you use those uh, as while creating your content, while when creating your guides? Do you watch lots of YouTube videos with tutorials and then, then use some stuff, take stuff from them? Oh yeah, definitely. I I often use Red Kite's videos actually. I mean, they're some of the best I've seen on YouTube. They're very straightforward, detailed, well-researched, and you can see that a lot of effort went into every single one of his videos. I mean, you, you even have a table of content with timestamps to help you find directly what you need, which is just brilliant. I mean, you've made our lives so easy with your targeting pod videos, I mean, including mine. And I think you've really accomplished something special. I've always had my favorite content creators and Red Kite is certainly one of them. I've also used your F14 video so many times, Jabbers. Once again, you can see it's a labor of love. The fact that you presented videos for both the pilot and the Rio really brings a complete perspective to the operation of the uh, aircraft as a whole, which is something that I think a lot of content creators just glossed over because it was too complicated to do. It's probably the definitive tutorial series I've seen for the Tomcat. For the 8 side, I'd say Bunyap, Jerry Abbott, and Banjo are probably some of my favorites. I also like this guy from, uh, I think it was from Germany. Um, he was called John, XX, John XX, I think. I mean, there are a lot of tutorials online, but few of them are, are actually accurate enough while being uh, interesting to watch. And of course, uh, I need to mention Crash Leoby because I think the guy's just hysterical. He's probably, he's probably one of the funniest guys I've ever 
listen to while doing DCS videos. He he makes me laugh. I mean, so hard every time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, thank you, Chuck. <laughs> it's uh, God, it's a lot of work, and I I spend a lot of time writing scripts and trying to get the information wrong. And I still mess it up very occasionally, like the specific point of interest rather than sensor point of interest. Like like I got on the uh, the GF seventeen, but so many other things you have to worry about. It's just you do make a mistake sometimes, and I can't retroactively fix it like I can, Chuck. I'm always envious of you being able to do that to your guides, but I can't do it with YouTube. That's the thing, though. Um, with uh, with uh, say the Mirage, for instance, when the uh, system rework went in, I mean, so many tutorials on YouTube got scrapped because of it, which is a real shame. But at some point, what you do? Yeah, that's the worst thing with early access: is things changing under you and videos or tutorial content just being out of date and invalid now. Oh, yeah, I was going to say exactly that. the The early access thing. The, the negative training and then the negative videos, so to speak, uh, become a problem. I, I still get comments from my Harrier stuff that I did way back when that first came out. And I probably should just remove those videos from, from the internet um, because of it. But people can't do the startup process anymore because the startup process changed. There's no alignment back then. Uh, there was a couple switches that hadn't been implemented. So I didn't, I didn't put them in because of that. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, like the FLIR video, I think the FLIR video shows uh, grayscale instead of green scale. And so it it has that problem. It also people are like, oh, how do I how do I get it gray like in your video? Well, it wasn't it wasn't green at the time. That's that's how it's supposed to be. So I think that that kind of stuff really bothers me. Yeah, but there's really no way around it. I mean, if you really wait for the module to become a full release, you'll have so many others that this one will be almost forgotten. It's not just that, it's also the way YouTube works. The older videos will get more views in most cases. They'll come to the top of the search rankings over yours usually, even if they are old and outdated, just because they've got the more views and so they're ranked higher. So it's a real pain when you, especially if you're yourself trying to find tutorial content, you've got to be really careful with that. And you won't always know going into a new module that it's changed. So it's a minefield, really. Well, the perils of making tutorials and trying to help others. Oh, yeah. And for, for me in particular, whenever I work on something, I mean, a lot of people are happy with it, which is great. But the the way I'm seeing things is I always have this fixation on stuff that I get wrong and the stuff that I get right. Uh, Jack, uh, is there a what's your dream module like? The one you really like to have a fly, or is it already released? Oh, my dream module. Hmm, that's a tough one. Um, I know for helicopters, I'd want the Chinook for sure. Um, I see. I saw a bunch of them flying near Canadian bases, and it's an amazing helicopter. However, I've always had this interest in uh, British and French aviation. The one fighter jet I always wanted to have was the Mirage 3, while the bomber jets I always wanted to have were the British V bombers, which were, uh, hang on, oh yeah, they were the Valiant, the Victor, and the Vulcan. I've had the privilege of visiting aviation museums at uh, RAF Cosford and uh, Doxford as well. And I'll always remember this moment where I saw Vulcan up close. It's a huge, massive thing of beauty. Another cool airplane would be probably the Blackburn Buccaneer. I mean, it was a nuclear f um, fighter bomber that operated uh, a bit like a Vigan. And it operated from aircraft carriers. It was... Uh, very, a very interesting aircraft. Also, I know the DCS World War II side of things has always been a somewhat controversial subject for people. I mean, but I can't help it. I just love these old birds. I've always wanted to have one of these big four engine heavy bombers like the Lancaster or the B-17. I don't know if any of you guys ever flew the B-17 sim for uh, FSX, if I recall correctly which was made by A2A Simulations. I mean, they've done such an amazing, amazing job with the Flying Fortress that I think, I really think the heavies deserve their place in DCS. You know, it's, it's one of these things that always fascinated me uh, since I saw the movie uh, Memphis Bell. I know at the moment the American planes are where the money's at. The American market's always been uh, one of the more lucrative ones. It's hard to compete with aircraft like the Hornet, the Viper, the Tomcat. 
However, I think I think I've always had a great deal of respect for developers like uh, Rasbam, Aviodev, Hitler, or Magnitude that tried to do aircraft that were completely foreign to me. Like uh, like the Vigan, who would have thought that this aircraft would ever be simulated? I mean, it's, it's always a risky move, but I think I think uh, these kind of modules are always some small gold nuggets hidden in there. Well, getting more and more modules, and it's really developing. So, uh, and also the, the the World War Two part, two part is also getting a lot from Ed. I think so. Uh, you never know. Yeah, hopefully the. I know it's a controversial opinion because a lot of people don't care for World War II modules, but for me, it's uh, it's always been one of my favorite kind of aircraft to fly. The different challenges to modeling these aircraft, say for piston engines, uh, just the way the damage is um, the damage is modeled, the uh, third the thermodynamic models, the overheating, uh, overspeeding, that sort of stuff. I mean the way. Yeah, I think his name is Yo-Yo, the uh, main engineer for the uh, engine simulation at Eagle Dynamics. The work he does is just phenomenal. Yeah, I'm really that <clears throat> took that much into World War Two uh, myself, but I see that making good progress. And uh, I think, I mean, t t for instance, the, the damage model that will come first to World War Two and then will move to the modern planes also tells you something that, well, they, they invest a lot in that. Oh yeah, and uh, I, th I think a sim that did it exceedingly well is uh, the IL-2 series for mainly structural damage, the wings bending, the spars being deformed, fuel leaks, glycol leaks. I mean, there's just so much stuff that's modeled in there that's interesting for me, uh, just for gameplay purposes. Like, how do you manage a damaged engine? How do you bring an aircraft back home? All right, I guess any any more questions? I wanted to ask uh, Chuck, like in the Fighter Pilot podcast, about his uh, you know, like nickname where it came from or a call sign. But before we do, any other uh, questions you have, guys? Yeah, Chuck Al here. Uh, Chuck Al Tricker here. I just want to say uh, one, it's good to hear your voice and put a uh, voice to your guides. Two, your guides help me out tremendously. And anytime I make a video, I usually reference your guides. And three, you were talking about the pilots they use, you know, flows and stuff like that. And I just want to say, yeah, that's what we do. You know, um, when we go through training, it's the most important thing is like learning the flow because you do your flow and then you do a checklist to back up your flow kind of thing. But, uh, you know, as a pilot, I just want to say like your guides are, I think they flow really well. So like I'm always reading your guides all the time, uh, like on my overnights and stuff like that, just to think of, you know, ways to make more content or clarify things like from a, you know, a guide or a, a PDF file to a YouTube video that hasn't been put out there. Because, uh, you know, like Red Kite's one of my favorite YouTubers and I watch him all the time. But, uh, you know, your guides are so good. But sometimes there's some stuff out there that is not covered in the guides. And that's usually stuff that I like to cover that's more in depth. So I just want to say thanks. And uh, it's glad to have or good to have you on the show. Well, thanks. But, you know, for the uh, just I've experienced firsthand the pilot training thing because, uh, well, I flew maybe a dozen a dozen hours in a small system 52. And <laughs> once again, I got the, a brutal, brutal call back to reality on some aspects, like the uh, importance of uh, good radio communication, being aware of your surroundings, just making sure that you've got everything checked out. And I mean, I, I, Sometimes you, when you play for a long, long time simulator, you tend to have like this impression that, oh, I could totally fly this plane in real life. And at some point, you, once you start flying in real life, you just start wondering, well, ugh, I mean, could I? I mean, flying in real life is, for me was just such a different experience than I, than I experienced in other desktop simulators. Yeah, it's totally true because I used to fly like the Airbus for like flight simulator and stuff like that way back then. And I have a, I had a great understanding of the Airbus that I fly now, but like when I first got in the Airbus, like I knew what to do, but like just being in the Airbus and actually doing it yourself and touching things, you're like, holy crap, this is completely different. So, but anyway, just want to say like, thanks for the new A10 guide as well, because uh, I didn't think you're ever going to do a new updated A10 guide. And I was actually pretty surprised. And I was like, holy crap, there's a 485 page uh, A10 guide with completely new graphics and everything. So I was blown away by that new one. Yeah, a lot of love uh, went into that one. 
I mean, f- even for me, at some point, when you st- stop flying a plane for a couple of months, then you just get back to it, and you're like, oh, man, I missed this and this and this other thing. And then for me, it's an eternal story of just scope creep all the time. I mean, I started with 100 pages, and at some point, you just wake up and you realize, oh, crap, I've done like three times what I was supposed to do. I think the, the scope creep happens to, to myself. I'll start with a topic and then I'll, okay, let's talk about the history. Let's talk about the systems. Let's talk about where it came from. Let's talk about what it was made to do. Let's talk about the, and at some point, uh, you know, oh, this system's kind of adjacent to it. Let's cover that too. And then, and then at some point you end up with a script that was exceeded by, uh, far exceeded your initial, uh, idea. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's not even for tutorials, but even for developers at some point there's, there's a place when you're you need to draw the line where you need to just well is it good enough or do I want to spend like 300 more hours to, trying to code this thing I mean it's a, it's a really difficult to balance how much effort you want to put in a certain aspect of a simulation yeah totally agree so the biggest question here is uh f16 guide when oh the viper well it's being worked on even if the dcs viper's early access isn't quite near where I want it to be. Uh, I'm working on what's functional at the moment, but there's still an awful lot missing, really, which makes my life difficult at the moment. Especially since in, it's an aircraft that's pretty well documented and very complex. I've had pretty mixed feelings about early access in general, but I do hope that Eagle Dynamics starts shifting in second gear and uh, bring the missing systems to us as soon as they can. So yeah, uh, the Viper will get there in the near future, but I can't really say when exactly, but but it's coming. Well, I, I think, um, you know, I know you started a new, <clears throat> excuse me, I know you started a Patreon recently too, and I think, uh, you know, not to give you ideas, but to give you an idea, it might be cool to release some of those sections to your Patreon members early. Um, and I only say that because I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll i'll think about it sounds good all right so where did the all come from in the check all oh uh, well it's not really a complicated story but it's uh I, actually the uh, in quebec we're a bilingual province so there's a french-speaking majority and uh, there are also anglophones like in the rest of canada and um my family name is actually starts with three vowels, which is for Anglophones, it's super weird to try to pronounce all the time. So uh, at some point, some guy just gave up and just called me Mr. Owl. And that's how the nickname came. Well, it's stuck. Nice. All right, guys, unless you have any more questions, uh, I think we need to, we, 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 we want to thank you very much, Chuck, for your time and getting to know your uh, well, the background of your guys and how they come to being and what will come next, which is what, the F-16, right? Uh, um, maybe. Unless something else, yeah, comes in the way in between. And um, so thanks a lot for, for being here with us uh, and for sharing all those all that information. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Chuck. We really do appreciate it, uh, taking the time to come here and discuss this stuff because uh, I know the community adores your guides as we all do so really fascinating stuff and really cool to hear uh how you put them together and your background and where it all started in the history of it so thanks again and to all the listeners if you if you uh, want to ask some questions to, to check i think you can use uh, our discord channel or facebook channel uh, so we'll make sure to pass it on uh, and to get you the answers yeah i just want to say thanks again uh, chuck for coming on and also one last question for you. When is the scratch and sniff guide coming out for uh, different jets? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I was thinking, uh, there should probably be a Patreon tier for that. <laughs> the scratch and sniff <laughs> tier. <laughs> and I was going to say for Dutt, he needs a, a pop-up picture book. So if you can make pop-up picture guides, that'd be a lot better for Dutt. <laughs> Dear God. <laughs> I think uh, I think that would be fascinating. I'd buy them just 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 because. So that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, and just wanted to mention that the intro and outro music that you have 
Listen, I will listen to as has been composed by Jaime Lopez from the Fighter Fighter Power podcast, and the voice is by Joseph Guerrero. So thank you very much for those. And if you have any questions or anything you'd like to share with us, just feel free to check out our Discord or Facebook, which you'll find in the notes of this episode. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Air Combat Sim. Don't forget to subscribe or tell a friend about it. You have a question, idea for an episode, or a special guest you'd like us to invite? Feel free to reach out on Facebook, Discord, or via email. Air Combat Sim was brought to you by BVR Productions. Yeah, I never did BMS. I don't know about all the other guys here, but I think I'm like the only one that never played or flew the simulation of BMS. I I think um, we need to be careful when we're talking about and make sure we don't mention too much. You know, it's it's not to be said around here. <laughs> Pardon me for bringing it up.